tonight we turn to the closing verses of 1 Corinthians 9. We will be concentrating on verses 24 through 27. Hear the word of God. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, thank you for your servant Paul, for his observations, and for how you used his observations to convey truth, so that we might receive from your Spirit the truth that we are to live by. Give us ears to hear tonight, Lord. Help us to absorb and to assimilate this teaching that we might live faithfully in its light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been only a couple of months now since the Winter Olympics concluded in Pyeongchang, South Korea. I don't know about you, but our family always enjoys watching these competitions, whether it's the summer games or the winter version. And mingled in with the actual competitive moments are those frequent human interest stories where you meet one of the athletes and you learn about his or her life. And one thing is always clear in the coverage these Olympic athletes devote their lives to their sport. Whether it's skiing or skating, swimming or running, no matter which sport they choose, they commit themselves to continuous training. Often their training becomes their full-time work, 10 to 12 hours a day, five, six, seven days per week. It seems that they eat and drink and breathe their sport of choice. But even that is not enough to guarantee a gold medal at the Olympics. Their performance on the actual day of their event will either dash their hopes or realize their dreams. Casual participants in any sport, the so-called weekend warriors, do not win medals at the games. So the formula is really rather simple. Give your all for a chance to win the prize. Devote yourself and discipline yourself if you would stand on the podium and hear your national anthem being played. Of course, this modern athletic phenomenon of the Olympics has its roots in ancient Greece, where those games were enormously popular and important. And while everyone knows about the Olympic Games, there was another competition that was held in Greece every two years called the Isthmian Games. And those games were conducted in Corinth, and it seems that they occurred during the time that Paul himself was actually living and ministering and preaching in Corinth. Now, we don't know whether Paul actually attended those games held in A.D. 51, but he was certainly aware of them. And he uses them to his own spiritual advantage. They become Paul's analogy for Christian living. So tonight, as we look at this closing section of chapter 9, we want to consider, first of all, athletic analogies. Then we're going to hear a call to the Corinthians, 
and close with Paul's personal determination. Well, as Paul wraps up his chapter and drives home his main point, he deliberately borrows from the well-known Isthmian games of Corinth in terms of several athletic analogies. And the first analogy is found in verse 24. It is a race for runners. Those who run in a race all run, he says. Well, whether these were short races, like a 100-meter dash, or a longer race, such as a full marathon, doesn't really matter. The point holds true for both sprinters and distance runners. And the specific direction of Paul's analogy is this. In a race, all run, but only one receives the prize. And surely the Corinthians were well aware of this dynamic. They had seen these games, they had watched many races, and they knew that at the end, though the whole field had run, only one was the winner. <coughs> these were the good old days, when only one prize was awarded. They did not have participation ribbons given out to everyone who participated, regardless of performance. But it was the actual winner of the competition who received the acknowledgement and who was awarded. The second athletic anal analogy that we find in our text has to do with boxing. And it shows up in verse 26. I box in such a way as not beating the air, he says. Now, it's not entirely clear whether Paul is speaking here about shadow boxing or just bad boxing. Shadow boxing is done by a boxer as something of a practice pantomime. He fights an imaginary opponent. He practices his punches against thin air. And this may serve as good practice for certain techniques, but the boxer never actually lands a blow on his opponent. Well, the other view says that this is actually describing an undisciplined boxer who is flailing around, throwing punches <coughs> wildly, but he's missing his target. So if he is speaking about an actual fight, well then Paul is claiming to be an effective boxer who doesn't throw punches and miss his target. Paul says, I'm a better boxer than that. I know how to land a punch. Well, as he then goes on in verse 27, the Greek here literally says, I give my body a black eye and I make it my slave. So the boxing or the fighting analogy carries over from verse 26 into verse 27. And here he is speaking about his own body as his sparring partner. I throw the punch and I give my own body a black eye. I am bruising my body, he says. Well, mixed in with these two specific analogies is a more general observation about athletes. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. And here is a truism about serious athletes. If they're going to compete, they must be self-controlled all the time. That is true for their training periods leading up to the competition, 
as well as their behavior during the competition and specifically during their own time of performance. There have been cases in the past, one skier, for instance, who did not control himself when it came to drinking on the night before his competition. So he would often go into the competitions in these downhill ski events and still be under the influence of alcohol. Not surprisingly, his performance dropped off and he did not win the medals he was expected to win. This is years ago, not this recent games. So self-control, self-discipline is absolutely crucial. Just think about all the various things that have to be controlled for a successful athlete to perform well. They eat a very specific diet determined by nutritionists and given out in very controlled amounts. They have workout schedules which are designed to build and to maintain muscles needed for their particular sport. They must get adequate amounts of sleep. And if there is any sickness or injury, it is very carefully treated to heal them as quickly as possible and to keep them from ingesting banned substances which could disqualify them from the games. Then during the time of the event itself, they are in a completely controlled situation and they are constantly monitored by their coaches. So if an athlete won't exhibit self-control, he will fail. He won't win the prize that he seeks. And so it kind of goes without saying that the best athletes are synonymous with self-control. So here Paul brings in these three different points. The runners running the race, the boxers going into the ring, and athletes in general, and their great commitment to self-control. As I was thinking about this text and about this sermon, I kind of had a sexist thought. And you'll forgive me if I say, here's a sermon the guys will really sink their teeth into. I know there's ladies who love sports as much as men love sports, but men love sports. And here's Paul using sporting analogies. And it really connects with a lot of people, and if, if I'm correct, a lot of men to say, I know exactly what he's talking about. Which is the sign of a good preacher who knows how to use good analogies. If Paul were going to talk about rocket ships flying to the moon, landing on the moon, and then flying back again, well, the Corinthians would have had no idea what that was about. Paul himself would have had no idea what that was about. It would have no overlap into life. But if you've been to the games, if you've sat there cheering in the crowd as you've watched runners coming across the finish line, or if you've been ringside to watch a boxing match, if you've studied athletes... These analogies work. They work profoundly at deep levels. As I myself enjoy watching a variety of sports, I can see that there's dangers involved. Football, for instance, it's a pretty dangerous sport. Concussions are becoming such an issue in football. But to have a really good football player who is playing at peak efficiency, who is the very best at his position in the entire league, it's really a monumental achievement, which has taken a lifetime of discipline. And there's plenty of guys who have the skill set to succeed who don't succeed. It's all got to come together and be applied in a controlled way to have sustained success. And Paul is saying, think about these analogies in terms of the Christian life. 
Well, after reviewing these analogies, we might wonder, what is Paul really saying here to the Corinthians? And also, what is he saying to us, his 21st century readers? Well, in brief, it seems that Paul is calling his readers to a certain approach to Christian living. That approach includes self-control, motivation, determination, perseverance, and self-discipline. Self-control, motivation, determination, perseverance, and self-discipline. And he is setting the bar for Christian living quite high. He's not willing to accept a kind of lowest common denominator Christian living. If you can say the Apostles' Creed occasionally, that'll be enough. We'll call it good. If you show up to church maybe once or twice a year, we'll say that's good enough. If you maybe will read your Bible, oh, I'd say once in a decade, that you're doing okay. This is no lowest common denominator Christianity that Paul is calling for. He is setting the bar high, and he's saying, here's what you strive for. Here's what you attain to. And if this makes you feel somewhat inadequate, if this causes you to think, I'm underperforming, well, that's part of what Paul is doing here. His call is a call upward, not a call to laziness and indolence. It's a call to really give your all for Christian living. I think in a certain sense, Paul's call is summed up there at the end of verse 24 when he says, run in such a way that you may win. As you run the race, You must focus all of your energies on winning. And so that means that you're not running around aimlessly, willy-nilly, with no direction. You're not merely expending energy for the sake of expending energy, but rather you harness your energies in order to cross the finish line first. You want to be the person who is the winner of the race, so you do all within your power to accomplish that good goal. You run and you fight with determination and deliberation. You know what you're about, and you're aiming to accomplish your purpose. You want to beat the field. You want to knock out your opponent. One of my earliest memories from grade school was out on the playground, and we were having races. And even back in kindergarten, I was not a fast runner. I was rather slow. And so when I would get into these races against a classmate, I went into these races expecting to lose. (laughs) But in a way, that kind of motivated my Uh, immature perspective to say, well, at least give it your all and see if you can beat that guy for a change. And so I would just run as hard and as fast as I could, and I still lost. (laughs) But the effort was there. And you see, he's saying, run in such a way as to win the prize. Now, we recognize that Paul is not saying here that all the Christians of church history are going to be running this race, and only one of them is going to get the prize, so only one of you will go to heaven. Hope it's you. (laughs) No, that's not the point. He's not talking about the number of contestants that will end up in the victory circle, so to speak. He's saying, give it your all. Run with such determination that you run in order to win at all costs. And if you're like me, You've got to give it your all because you cannot just coast on natural giftedness or native ability. 
Well, in order to do this, to win the race, he suggests that they have to exercise self-control. If they don't discipline themselves, no one is going to do it for them. Athletes must have a high level of self-government, saying no to self or yes to self as wisdom dictates. I was reading about one of my favorite professional basketball teams, and one of their players, who's a very, very good player, has been in something of a slump lately. So before the game Saturday, he went early to the arena, got into the practice gym. He was, a security guard was there to open up for him. Nobody else in the whole complex. And Paul George is out there shooting shots to try and break out of his slump. And so when game time actually comes, he hits his first, and then he hits another one. And he had a good night, and his team won. Because he had the self-control to say, rather than staying in the hotel and eating another cheeseburger, I am going to go to the arena early before anyone else gets there. Nobody is asking me to do this. The coach didn't tell me to do this. The organization, the league didn't tell me to do this. I'm going to do this because I've got to score some points in that game if we're going to win. It's that kind of self-control that the Christian must have. Nobody looks over your shoulder and tells you what you have to do as a Christian. Nobody wakes you up in the morning and says, read your Bible, spend some time in prayer, sing a psalm or a hymn. Those voices just aren't there. So how do you get out of bed to spend some minutes with the Lord before the pace of the day picks up? Self-control, self-government. A Christian without self-control is as hopeless as an athlete who refuses to practice his sport or to obey the rules during competition. An out-of-control, uncontrolled Christian is heading fast for massive failure and public embarrassment. Keep yourself under control. Discipline yourself. This is a large part of Paul's call to his readers. If you're going to live the Christian life in such a way as to win the prize, if you're going to give it your all, you must push you. You must demand things from yourself and don't take no for an answer. Be self-controlled. Well, he also speaks here about motivation. And I think this is really most interesting. Why do the athletes train so diligently as they do? Why do they compete so fiercely Why do they subject themselves to the rigors of this self-controlled lifestyle? Well, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, Paul says. That is what they get for their troubles. A temporary trophy showing that they won the competition. Now, in our day and age, you get a trophy that's got an inscription, you know, so-and-so won the championship in 1987, and we put it in our trophy case, and we can look at it every so often. But this is much more temporary. Just how temporary that prize was is best described by Ciampa and Rosner. They write, in the local Ismian games, the victor's crown was woven out of withered celery. While Christians anticipate an eternal reward from the God who called them. Hayes paraphrases Paul's thought in this way. If these athletes push themselves to the limit in training 
to win that pathetic crown of withered vegetables. How much more should we maintain self-discipline for the sake of an imperishable crown? And that's right. We compete for an eternal crown of glory, something that is substantial, that doesn't perish or decay or fade away. We are not living the Christian life in order to obtain some withered celery. We strive for eternal rewards. So if these athletes are so motivated by such a pathetic prize, how much more motivated should the Christian be to obtain the crown of glory that lasts throughout all eternity? And this is something we need. We need that motivation to say, you know what, I'm making the hard choices, I'm doing the right things, I'm living faithfully, I'm pushing myself because I am looking to the finish line and there's a crown of glory that awaits me. And oh, how I yearn to have that glory that will be mine when my Savior places it upon my brow. So you see the argument from the lesser to the greater. If they can do so much, such discipline, such diligence, such training, such execution, if they can do it for withered celery, we can do this if we will keep our eyes on the prize. Even Jesus himself used motivational techniques. But for the joy set before him, Hebrews says, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Because he looked beyond the cross and he saw the joy of redeeming a people unto himself. He saw the joy of being with his redeemed people for all eternity. And so Jesus pushed through the cross and its pain and its shame and its humiliation to win the prize. Sometimes very pious Christians suggest that we shouldn't worry about motivations. We shouldn't be focused on prizes because that's just greedy. But no, that's not greedy. That's biblical. The prize is set out before us. And it is held out to us as the motivation we need to keep pushing when we don't feel like going another step. Now, right now, all around the world, there are gymnasts and there are athletes of other sports, skaters and skiers, who are all doing their work. Why are they doing this? They're looking ahead to four years from now when I'll be at the next games, and then I'll finally win that gold medal I've been working for all my life. And so we too have to say, there's the motive, the great grand motive of the glory of God given to us, and we will strive for that. So again, Paul is not saying, here's a simple and easy approach to the Christian life that you could probably do in your sleep. He's saying, no, the Christian life takes some real focus, some real determination, some real perseverance, some real motivation, if you are to do it well, run in such a way as to gain the prize. Well, as Paul winds down his point, and finishes this chapter, he turns in a very personal direction. This is seen even in the pronouns that he uses. In verses 24 and 25 of our text, he speaks about they. And then he turns to we. And now by the very end of the chapter, he's talking about I and my. I run, I box, I discipline, my body. So now Paul is thinking of himself. So he can say, as he does elsewhere, that he has run in such a way 
as to gain the prize. He boxes in such a way as to knock out his opponent. Paul himself is the very picture of self-control, of determination, of motivation, and of discipline. Paul is no out-of-control brawler, but he is a finely tuned, sharply focused fighting machine. But then there is the curious statement in verse 27 about giving himself a black eye. He beats his own body. He makes it a slave. Well, what is that talking about? Is Paul just carried away into hyperbole? Well, actually not at all. He is tying here his point to the main thrust of what he's been arguing all along. Paul subdues his own body and he enforces discipline on himself so that after he has preached to others, he himself won't be disqualified. Now to catch the significance, we just need to briefly rewind the tape. Paul had told them that they must be willing to sacrifice their rights for the good of others. He had then anticipated their objection. So tell us, Paul, when have you actually done what you're insisting that we must do? When did you forego your rights for the good of others? Well, Paul's reply is to remind them that although he had a right to the material support of the Corinthian congregation, he had not exercised that right. He had not claimed that privilege. He had actually foregone his right with them in order that he might preach the gospel to them free of charge. And now, in these closing verses, I believe he returns to his earlier point. I beat my body. I gave myself a black eye. I made my own body become my slave. And that is not some strange exercise in self-flagellation. But really, it's rather the kind of sacrifice that he's been speaking about all along. Paul's saying, look, I've sacrificed my own comfort and my own ease in order to preach to others. And I did that so I wouldn't be disqualified myself. What I've been telling you to do, I have done. So I am not one of these who will tell you to do such and such and then go and do the opposite or neglect it altogether. There is a real temptation that faces every preacher. It's a temptation to tell others what they ought to do and to be as Christians, but then never to follow through with your own advice. You preach and you preach and you preach, but you never actually practice what you preach to others. This is a man who tells others to put their trust in Christ, but he himself never trusts Christ. He counsels them to pray, and yet he himself never prays. His pious advice is all good and right as far as it goes, but if he never applies it himself, he may find himself shut out on the final day. To have proclaimed the good news of salvation by grace through faith without ever having believed on Christ to the saving of your own soul is a most pitiable condition. Paul was zealous to save others, but he is earnest for his own salvation too. So if he had advised them to sacrifice for the good of their fellow believers, well, he had better be ready to put it into practice himself. And he has. He has not neglected what he taught them. So once again, we hear Paul saying, you need to sacrifice for the good of others, just as I myself have done. You need to run in such a way as to receive the prize just as I have run. 
you need to exhibit the same self-control and self-discipline as you have seen me exhibit in my own life. Because I don't want you to be disqualified, but neither do I wish to be disqualified myself. I think it's very interesting that from time to time in his writings, and especially later in his life, Paul comes back to this. He knows that his own death is near, and he reflects on this. He doesn't want to have run the race in vain. He doesn't want to be disqualified at the last. And this is something which every true and sound preacher must feel in their own soul. I stand up here Sunday after Sunday preaching to you. And I ought not to ignore my own preaching. I ought not to be telling you what to believe and how to live and just walk away and forget it myself. Because if I were to do so, there would be a very lonely place in hell for my soul. Because I've been a preacher who failed to believe and to obey the very word I preach to others. And I would just close by again asking you, pleading with you, to pray for me. Pray that my faith, my diligence, my self-control would be so clear and evident that people would look at Brian Dia and say, there's a preacher who practices what he preaches. He's no mere pulpiteer, no showman who can talk a good line but never lives it out. How I want people and how I want Christ to say, there is a preacher who practices what he preaches. And I know my own sinful tendencies. I know the frailty of my own soul. I know my own ability, as Paul knew his ability, to live in such a way as to be disqualified at the last. How heartbreaking it is, and this happened during the Olympic Games, to have someone even in the medal round, and then through some violation of the rules he's disqualified and set aside and it's as if he had never even raced the race what a fearful thought what a sobering thought pray for me let's pray lord thank you that you indeed do give us the strength and the grace to run in such a way as to gain the prize. And Father, help us and help me especially to apply all that your word says to not only hear it, to not only speak it, but to be doers of the word and not mere hearers who deceive themselves and forget what they have heard, or what they have preached. Lord, we do not want to be disqualified. We want instead to hear your words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter your master's happiness. Help us to that end. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.